Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen, amen. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, give the Lord a hand. Amen. Hey, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Anybody ready? Yeah. Maybe a little. Okay, two of you. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Uh, love Christmas time. Love Christmas time. In fact, uh, we know this story. I want to read it to you. It's in the same region. There were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them when the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there was born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men whom he is pleased. And that's the Christmas story. It's simple. I've been reading it all week, and I, I've been watching uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas story. Anybody else watch that? Amen. I know I'm dating myself, and you know, some of these guys aren't old enough to know who Charlie Brown is, you know, except for that one cartoon. And, and I keep looking at that over and over again, and we love that story. In fact, we look forward to it. In fact, that's why some of you are coming to church this month is because you want to hear this story and, and because we live in the Bible Belt. But what if I told you, because I really believe this is true, what if I told you there was a group of people in this room, and maybe it's you, maybe it's not, and maybe there's a whole group of people here this morning, and maybe uh, you work with a group of people, and what if I told you this morning that there's a spiritual virus that's been going on for centuries called doubt? I'm not sure I believe that. I mean, angels appearing in the sky, really? And what if I told you there were some people that, that, that honestly think it's a real stretch that there are a group of people still in this century get together and do what we're doing this morning? Doubt. In fact, if you're here this morning and, and you have doubts and you've been struggling with your faith, you couldn't be here on a better morning. And we are so glad you're here this morning because well, we want you to know at Summit Heights, we're not afraid of questions and we're not afraid of doubt. You see, the sickness of doubt is varied. And maybe you've come to the conclusion that uh, I was told a few weeks ago by one guy that God doesn't exist. And maybe you're there, or maybe you've come to the conclusion this morning that, uh, that, that God really can't forgive you because you are just got too much of the devil in you. I've had somebody tell me that. Or you wonder whether the Bible really is the word of God. Or you question why God lets people suffer. Or, or maybe, maybe you've been praying because you're struggling. And it seems like nobody's home in heaven. And you keep knocking on that door. Thanks, Patty. You keep knocking on that door. And you're thinking, okay, nobody's home, right? Because God ain't answering. And maybe you've questions about God and how he created the world and how it's going to end. Or you're wondering for other things between heaven and hell. And are God, is God really going to send somebody to hell and Satan and angels and miracles and the virgin birth? I mean, come on, really? Virgin birth? Come back next week. We'll talk about that. And then the resurrection and then the end times. And you got all these things going on. And maybe you've said to yourself that, you know, I think I became a Christian, but I'm not even sure about that. In fact, I would say this room could be divided up into three sections, and I'm not putting any of you in a section, so don't hear me say that this morning, okay? But if you divided people up, there are those who have doubted, there are those who will doubt, and then there's a group of brain dead people, amen? 
And here's what I mean by that. I'm not insulting anybody, okay? Because I'm like, what? Did he just call me brain dead if it fits, okay? Um, what I'm saying is, is if you're a person that doesn't think at all, yeah, you're probably not going to doubt. But if you seriously contemplate your faith and what it means to follow Jesus, the chances are every once in a while you're going to come down to some questions. And if you've lived long enough, you're going to have some issues and uncertainties and doubts. And by the way, that's not just a Christian experience. That's the human experience. That we have doubts and questions. That's what drives some of you to education. That's what drives some of you to academia. That's what drives some of you to all the different things you run towards. Because it's a human experience, not just a Christian experience that we doubt. And what I find is even professed atheists, which by the way, I don't believe in atheists. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But even professed atheists change their minds about what they believe. Isn't that amazing? So the question isn't, will you catch a virus of doubt? Because you probably will. The big question is, is how do you prevent the virus? And if you get it, how do you get out of it? Right? See, the problem is that some of us, we don't want to admit it. And you think you have to have everything figured out. And so for some of you in this room and, and that older generation, and I, I'm not calling you old, but I grew up in that generation too, that we were taught never to have questions. In fact, I had a pastor one time tell me when I was questioning him about something, he said, oh, no, son, listen to me. You need to stick to what you know. And it kind of pushed me back. And so there's this whole idea that questioning was wrong. And I want to tell you this, it is okay. You're in a safe place to come clean this morning that you can have questions here. We've said this for years at Summit Heights, that this is a safe place for you to investigate the claims of Christ. We're not afraid of questions. Now, we may not have a clear answer for you, amen? Never heard that from a preacher, have you? Not gonna have a clear answer because all preachers have clear answers. See, the older I get, the more I realize, the less I'm willing to take a bullet for. Amen? If it's not Jesus, and I'm not going to fight. In fact, if you came here to fight, you've come to the wrong place. We've said that for the last few years. I'm just not going to argue anymore. I'm just not there. So it's okay. You can admit it. So let me mention some doubts about faith because I think some of us have this whole idea about, about doubts and, and about all these things. Now, first of all, some of you have been taught through the years that doubt is the opposite of faith. And it's a myth because the opposite of faith is unbelief. And that's an important distinction. The opposite of faith is unbelief. And what is unbelief? Well, according to the scriptures, unbelief refers to a willful refusal to believe, or it refers to a deliberate decision to disobey God. Let me tell you what unbelief is. Unbelief is sin. It's a willful decision to disobey God. That's unbelief. Doubt is to be indecisive or ambivalent. You're not real sure. You're just not sure. You're kind of hung up between certainty and uncertainty. And so there's this idea that, hey, if you have doubt, then that's unbelief. No, unbelief is a willful decision. We'll talk about that in a minute. Doubt is that you haven't come squarely down on disbelief. You're kind of up in the air. You're struggling. And what happens for many of us when we get to that struggling, we are so hell-bent on getting to a decision, we'll throw out everything and just say, I don't believe. And really, you just doubt. In fact, it's been said that struggling with God over the issues of life doesn't show a lack of faith. It is faith. If you struggle with the realities of where you are, that's not a lack of faith. No, that's faith. You should be struggling. I mean, I read the Psalms and I look at the psalmist and how many times the psalmist literally calls God out and almost calls God a liar. Where are you? Who are you? You said, and you said, and, and you, you promised, and you did that, and God, you're not, and all the, and you read the Psalms, you're like, oh my gosh, why didn't God strike him dead? You see, doubt's not unbelief, but the second thing I'd say is doubt is not unforgivable. Some of you have been taught that. But you think doubt is unforgivable, that we can't question God. Well, see, God doesn't condemn us when we question him. In fact, one of my favorite stories is in Luke chapter 7 where John the Baptist, y'all remember him? He, he was a pre-runner to Jesus. He was the guy that's out in the wilderness saying, repent for the Savior's coming. And, and he's, that, he's that wild man that was out there. In fact, he's the guy that baptized Jesus and witnessed all that thing. And, and Luke chapter 7, look at it. It says John's disciples because now John is in prison. See, here's what happens. You live long enough, life will happen to you. Amen? 
You live long enough, life will happen to you. You'll go to college, you'll have a professor, you'll have a marriage end, you'll get in trouble. Something will happen to you and you'll find yourself in prison. That's where John is. And John's disciples told him about all these things and calling two of them, John said, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? I mean, think about that. This is the same guy, John the Baptist, who, who once pointed to Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God. He pointed out Jesus. And, and he's also that same guy that was standing there when he baptized Jesus, that the heavens opened up, birds came flying down, and God spoke and said, this is my beloved. And now he's going, uh, because life happens, doesn't it? Life happens. You can be so sure about one thing. And life will happen to you and doubt will come in. And here's John looking at it. He's got doubts. He's not sure. Is Jesus really the Messiah? I'm in jail. It hadn't worked out. What do you think Jesus said? What do you think Jesus responded? Look at verse 22. So Jesus replied to his messengers, his disciples, go back and report to John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. The good news is proclaimed to the poor. In other words, instead of slam dunking John, because that's what church does, doesn't it? So many times you come to church and you doubt, guys like me, maybe in your past, have slam dunked you, and all of a sudden we see Jesus not slam dunking him, not thinking less of him, not doing anything. He says, go give him the evidence. Go tell him what you've seen. Check it out. In verse 28, we find what Jesus really thinks because after all this, Jesus is continuing to teach. He's continuing to heal and all that. In verse 28, then Jesus comes back and here's what he thinks of him. Because see, some of you think God's disappointed in you because you doubt it. Look at what Jesus said. I'll tell you, among those born of women, there's no one greater than John. And this is the dude that just doubted and now Jesus is bragging on him. <laughs> Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Think about that. Jesus gave John the highest compliment in the world. At the same time, John was in the midst of doubt. He didn't slam dunk him. And listen, he's not slam dunking you for having questions in your mind right now. Isn't that amazing? And some of you get all up in your head. You see, here's the third thing about doubt. You've probably been told that doubt is unhealthy. Oh, don't be doubting now. That's what I was told growing up. Don't be doubting. Stick to what you know, son. Don't question anything. Well, the truth is that doubt can actually produce some pretty positive side effects. I don't know if you've uh, been watching the TV here lately. I don't watch a lot of it, but I see a lot of flu commercials on. Anybody else watching those? Go get your flu shot. And there's this new flu shot out right now that has four times the amount of flu uh, um, um, immunization end and the normal shot. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that because if you don't know what an immunization is, it's when they take a little bit of the flu and they put it in you and now they've got one four times stronger and it's for senior adults. I'm thinking that doesn't seem right. But anyway, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a preacher. So, you know, I'm thinking about that. And the reason is, is because they put that immunization in your body and your body then fights against it and it makes you immune to it. And you see, some of us have been taught throughout our life is that we shouldn't ever doubt. That, that's not healthy. But listen, sometimes it strengthens us. And listen, we shouldn't be going looking for doubt. That's where some of you are in a bind. You're out there doing all the research of doubt, and you're not believing and looking at some of the, just the true sources of. And you're running around. You see, some of us are struggling with that. So what are the roots of doubt? What are the sources of doubt? And there's lots of them, but I want to look at three, and it involves your mind, your emotions, and your will. Your mind, emotions, will, because first of all, I believe doubt grabs a foothold in your mind, amen? That's where you come up with those intellectual objections where we begin wondering whether things like heaven and hell and Satan and angels and miracles and virgin births and, and resurrection and second coming and Armageddon, the whole place is going to burn up, right? And doubt often develops in our mind. And simply because we don't know why we believe what we believe. You ever had a conversation go like this? So, so you believe in Jesus, right? Yeah, sure. Yes, I do. 
And they'll look at you and go, well, why do you believe in Jesus? And you do what a good Baptist does, right? Because not all of you are Baptists, so I won't throw you into that, okay? And so you do what a good Christian does. Let's, let's clarify that because I'll get an email. You're picking on Baptists. But anyway, you'll do what you've been taught, and you'll pull your Bible out, and you'll begin turning pages, and then someone will look at you and go, hey, hang on. You don't expect me to believe anything in that book, do you? You're like, well, um, yeah, it's the Bible. And then they look at you and they say this to you. Everyone knows that the Bible is full of contradictions and mythology. <laughs> and don't you know that? I mean, come on. We live in the 21st century, man. Really? You're going to believe that? You expect me, an intellectual, to believe that? A book that's 2,000 years old? And then all of a sudden you look at them and go, yeah, I think. And then doubt gets there. And then all of a sudden you begin to question, maybe, maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe, maybe the Bible's not reliable. Maybe, maybe, maybe I swallowed the Jesus story hook, line, and sinker. You ever been there? You ever thought that? Said that Christians should just believe. You gotta have childlike faith. Faith of a child, man. And that's what Jesus said. The problem is many of us never grew up we never grew up. Yeah, it starts with faith like a child, but then it becomes a maturing faith where we grow into that. And the chances are, if you don't grow up, someone, sometime, somewhere, that professor is going to come to you and give you permission to doubt and for, give you permission to question. And all of a sudden, it's going to challenge your faith. And for some of you, you're going to throw it out because very honestly, you don't know why you believe what you believe, and that makes you vulnerable. Let me give you some instances. For some of you in this room, you know all about God's love. You know all, and you love that idea about God's love, but you don't know anything about God's justice, God's righteousness, or God's holiness. And so therefore, when God does something that doesn't seem loving to you, and you don't understand it, and God doesn't perform the way you think he should, all of a sudden doubt creeps in, or you get mad at someone because they're talking about justice and holiness and righteousness, and all you have is this idea about God is love, and God does something that doesn't seem loving to you, and all this tension comes in, and boom, you begin to doubt. Or how about this one? How about you've been told that God answers all your prayers, right? Because that's what a good God does. He answers all your prayers. What happens when he doesn't? What happens when they die? And you prayed and you cried out to God. And then all of a sudden you begin to sit in your room and nobody else is around and going, where are you, God? And you're not real. Or how about this one? All those crazy preachers, and yes, I said it, I'm on TV, all those crazy preachers that said God will make you rich and wealthy. And all of a sudden he doesn't, and you're living paycheck to paycheck, not because you're in debt, it's because you don't make enough on minimum wage to take care of your family, and you begin to wonder where is God? And doubt creeps in. You see, the problem isn't with God. He never promised to make you rich and healthy. He never promised to answer one of your, ever one of your prayers. The problem is that we've got an inadequate view of God, which is why we spent the last 14 weeks looking at the names of God so that we begin to understand who God is and what he does. And so doubt can breed in our minds, but it also infects our emotions. Because when we begin to doubt that, our emotional response is, for many of us, our whole faith is based on our feelings. We've got to have this euphoric feeling about our faith. And if it's not euphoric, then we've got to go find another euphoric moment to recreate that euphoric moment that we had at the last euphoric moment. <laughs> the problem is, you ever tried to live on your honeymoon for nine years? How many of you would like to try, amen? See, there was a time when I was young, I'm thinking, I could do that. Now that I'm 50, I'm going, I'm ready to go to bed, amen? Now don't look at me like I'm crazy, Right? You know what I'm saying? I don't want to be inappropriate. For... But see, what happens is many of us base our whole Christianity on great music and great preaching. And all of a sudden, when it's not so great or it's mediocre or it's too loud or Edward just has a really bad day because I have those. And then you walk out and go, well, preacher, we got to go find something that's a little more exciting. Really? Really? What happens if it's never exciting again? Well, I mean, come on, really? It's like that old song, I don't know where we went wrong, but the feeling's gone and I just can't get it back. 
because we've misunderstood the role of emotions and faith. Faith isn't fundamentally a feeling. Faith is a decision to trust God. I'm gonna trust him. I don't, I don't understand. It doesn't ebb and flow. You see, some of us, our mood swings get us and, 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 and we have that depression or maybe we're a little melancholy in our journey and so we're looking for those ebbs. And listen, faith is steady that Jesus, you don't change. Another way we doubt is some of us have been scarred in the past. We've suffered abuse as a child and we've, we've been abandoned or maybe that first marriage ended or maybe we were involved in a group and we found out it was a cult or a borderline cult and, and, and then we get burned and some guy says something stupid or we get hurt and we're just all along now at that place waiting for God and looking for God that God's gonna do the same thing in our past that somebody did to us. And then there's that last one that for many of us, there's a stubborn sense of pride that causes us to doubt. Now listen to me, this is so important because Oz Guinness says this, the proud man, don't miss this, the proud man needs to doubt because the sense of his own importance demands it. And it's not in his nature to bow to anyone. You see, it affects our emotions. It affects our mind. But listen to me, church. Listen to me, Christian. Listen to me, non-believer. It affects our will. And our will is where we make choices. You see, doubts multiply when we continue to willfully sin and not turn away from a pattern of sin. Because sin, of course, creates what? A lack of peace. That's why some of you will never be fully at peace with God because you continue to willfully live in sin, in addiction, living together, pursuing unrighteous, unholy relationships. Listen, I'm not being mean this morning. I'm just telling you, the reason that some of you are doubting today is because you continually, willfully live in sin. And sin will rob you of peace. See, when a person can't find peace, he's gonna begin to question, why isn't God comforting me? And God, you're distant, he begins to doubt, when actually the underlying cause of your doubt is a willful decision to cling to sin. Look what James says, James chapter four, verses one through three, he said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Your desire, you desire, but you do not have, so what do you do? You kill, you covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel, quarrel and fight. You don't have because you do not ask God, and when you do ask him, you don't receive it because you ask with the wrong motive. <laughs> that you may spend it on your own pleasures. And let me say this for some of you, because some of you just willfully sin, but some of you are not, some of you are not intellectually honest. And if you're watching, listen to me. Some of you are not intellectually honest when it comes to doubt. In fact, I've asked this question and I'm astounded at how many times I get the same answer. And it doesn't matter how smart someone is or how, how uneducated someone is, but what I find among the intellectual academia world is this. When I ask the question or the questions, have you ever read the New Testament? The whole thing. Have you ever read the red letters? Have you ever truly studied what Jesus said? And here's, my, here's their answers to me. Almost without doubt is, well, no, or at best, parts of it. Now, listen, I know some of you are looking at me and you're going, well, that's not me. Okay, I'm not, then I'm not talking to you, okay? So you can just listen for a minute. But you know somebody like that. And what amazes me is, what astounds me is, they'll go to great lengths to disprove the claims of Jesus without ever, ever giving intellectual honesty to the study of his actual claims. In fact, I was sitting with a guy the other night and I drew this. I want you to look at this. Anybody see a heart on that screen? There's, there's a heart on that screen. And imagine with me that that heart that you can't see right now represents you. And the rest of that white screen is the universe. Let me show you where you are. 
Go to that next screen. How many of you got it right? You go, oh, that, that was just a speck on the screen. <laughs> Whoops. That's a heart. Now imagine with me, some of you that are so intellectually sure that Jesus is a fraud, that that's you and that represents the entire universe. And let's go ahead and just be intellectually honest. The whole universe would be pretty much all of this wall up here, okay? And, and, and well, let's go ahead and take that to the next level. We can't bring the whole universe up, right? Would you agree with that? So you're telling me you're so sure in your finite position in the universe that God doesn't exist. Listen, the reality is you can believe that. And if in the end you're right, you've lost nothing. And in the end, if I believe that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world and I end up being wrong at the end, then I have lost absolutely nothing. But listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Be intellectually honest here because you're not that smart. I don't care who you are. You're not that smart. At the end, if I'm right and you're wrong, then I've gained everything and you've lost everything. So are you so sure? See, I don't believe in atheists. Atheists are so absolutely sure. And how many times I've drawn this at bars, at restaurants, and out in my own home, in my office, where I've drawn this out with my finger on the table and going, that's you, this represents the universe. Are you so arrogant to say you know everything? So you're not an atheist. Huh. And before we move on, we gotta remember we do have an enemy. And there is an enemy out there trying to deceive you. In fact, Jesus called him the father of lies and he's whispering in your ears right now. Some of you are sitting here this morning going, no, 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 no. That's the enemy whispering in your ear. Because some of you grew up in church. What's amazing to me is most atheists grew up in church. And someone hurt them, something happened, they ended up in prison. And prison doesn't mean a physical prison because of decisions they made. And they discount and throw out everything. Listen to me. 1 John 4, 4 says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. <laughs> So you see, for many of us, we're infected with doubt in our will, in our emotions, in our minds. And some of you, the reason you're doubting is because you're just willfully sinning. You're just willfully doing it. So what do you do? What do you do if you're in that moment? And you may be sitting here this morning and this is your first time to be in church in a long time. Maybe you came this morning because she wouldn't leave you alone and just said, if you'll come, I'll let you do it. Or maybe you got a free lunch coming and we're glad you're here. But what do you do with that? Number one, let me say this. I would encourage you, if you find yourself, because the scripture says that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling, amen? So no matter what you do, there is a working out of your salvation for many of us, when we get to that point of trembling, we throw it all out and we quit working it out. Amen? Amen? Well, go back and find the source of your doubt. Go on, go back. In other words, diagnose the source of your doubt because you're not going to be able to deal with it until then. I was sitting with a guy the other night. I'm going to call him Bill because he's, he knows where we are. And I sat in with Bill and I introduced myself because he asked, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm a pastor. And he goes, oh, it's great. I'm Bill the Atheist. I was like, wow, okay. How <laughs> Bill the Atheist? You know, so we were sitting there visiting. We sat there for a little bit and visiting. And finally, I looked at him because we were talking about football and we were talking about different things. So I finally turned around. And I said, Bill, when did you leave the faith? He goes, oh, oh, you talking about when did I, when did I realize this all in true? And I said, yeah. He said, when I got to college, he said, I got saved when I was seven years old. I went, oh, holy God. I mean, he used those words. I didn't use those words. He said, when I got to college, I ran into a professor and he gave me permission to question. And so I did. And in one semester, I threw out everything. I've never heard the F word used as much as I heard the F word used that night. I listened to him and then I drew that screen out for him. And I said, Bill, the reality is you could be right. And if you are, we've lost nothing. But Bill, the reality is there could be a God out there that loves you and died for you and has an eternity planned for you. And if I'm right, Bill, I gain everything and you lose everything. 
And I turned around to talk to my wife for a minute and I turned back around, Bill was gone. I've never seen Bill again. Bill knows where we are, he knows who we are. You see, for some of you, you need to go back to that source of doubt because some of you are basing your decision on a crazy professor. Come on, come on, yeah. Some of you are basing your decision based on a preacher that said something stupid, so you threw out everything. You ever go to a restaurant and get sick and quit eating for the rest of your life? <laughs> I mean, what other arena of life do you throw out everything other than religion? How asinine do you have to be? And some of you have thrown it out. Some of you have thrown it out. No, you don't throw it out. You just do your homework next time, amen? There's certain restaurants in Longview I'll never go back to. Can I get an amen? amen. It'll set you free. <laughs> I don't want to be that free, amen? <laughs> I like freedom, amen? <laughs> but I hadn't quit eating. Find the source of your doubt. And number two, ask for help. Ask for help. Some of you quit asking for help. Some of you threw out the baby with the bathwater and just decided that you were God. How good of a God have you made? I love it. When that guy, that father of the demon-possessed boy in Mark 9, 24, when he looked at Jesus and said immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my belief. In other words, he's looking at Jesus going, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief because there was still something in him he needed to ask for help. And the most important thing is, is he asked Jesus for help. Some of you are asking all these other idiots, I mean, now people in the world for help, amen? And they're smart idiots, okay? I read them. I bought a book translated from Russian into English just recently, and it's made my head pop off of my shoulders, man. And I literally have to put it down because they're like, these guys are idiots and they're smart. Or maybe I'm the idiot, I don't know. Listen to me, at the end of the day, when's the last time you asked Jesus? Jesus, help my unbelief. Just to ask for help and maybe you don't turn to God, but maybe you, you turn to someone else, Christians in your life. Remember what, what John sent his disciples, go check it out. And Jesus went back, go, go tell them what you saw. You may not have the faith in your own life. Look at the faith in someone else's life. I tell guys all the time that look at me, your God's not real. I said, then just watch. Just watch. I love it when people come up to me and they'll, they'll, I've had this said to Danielle and I more than once where they've said, I'm telling you, your God does more for you than any other God that I've ever experienced. And some of you are going, wait, there's only one God. Just drop it. Love people. Okay? Let them, let them struggle in there, but let them see your faith. Let them see. That's why small groups are so important. That's why Ecclesiastes 4, 9, 10 says two are better than one. See, some of you, when you got permission to question, you just abandoned everything. And you went and surrounded yourself with people that just thought like you. And you go, well, that's what you've done, Edward. Well, okay, let's think about that for a minute. Over here, you're totally closed-minded to everything. Over here, I'm involved in a group of people called Summit Heights that's not afraid to question. Come on. And if you're in a church that doesn't allow you to question, you need to leave that church and go somewhere that gives you freedom. Yes. I'm gonna say that again. If you're in a church that doesn't allow you to question, if you're listening on TV this week, you're listening on Facebook this week, you need to leave that church because that's a cult. And you need to get to a place where if Jesus didn't slam the apostle or, or the John the Baptist for doubting, he's not slamming you either. You can ask questions and God's big enough to handle them. So find the root of your doubt, ask for help, and then take care of your spiritual health. In other words, a body is less susceptible to viruses when it's healthy. Do you agree with that? See, a strong faith is better able to ward off a virus of doubt when it threatens you, just the same the way the body is. If you're eating bad and you're not exercising, it's no wonder your heart rate's outrageous. It's no wonder your diabetes is crazy. It's no wonder your cholesterol's nuts because you're not taking care of your body. And a body that's well taken care of will ward off diseases more. I went to the doctor last Friday. He said, are you on any medications? I'm gonna be 50 this year. And you know what I got to look at him and say? None. 
Not one. Because a body that's taken care of warts off that. Now, just like a body is strengthened through good nourishment and exercise, begin to build your faith on knowledge and action. And by knowledge, here's what I mean by that. Get serious about learning about God. Not what other people think about him, about God. I took a class called The Teachings of Jesus when I was at East Texas Baptist University. And we literally spent the whole semester talking about what other people thought about God and never got to actually the teachings of Jesus. And I went to my college professor, and I don't want to say it, but I went to my college professor and I looked at him. I said, hey, in the middle of class, so stupid. You know, I raised my hand and I said, hey, doctor. He said, yes, sir. I said, this is the teachings of Jesus. Your syllabus said we're going to talk about the teachings of Jesus. Are we ever going to get to the teachings of Jesus and not talk about what other people think about Jesus? Now, let me say this to you if you're in college. Don't ever call your professor out in class because I got kicked out of the teachings of Jesus and I was not allowed to take it again. Some of you need to get serious about what Jesus said and not what other people think Jesus said. And see, that scares you. That scares you. You see, some of you need to systematically study the Bible the way you study atheism, Buddhism. See, I have a ton of respect. I've got a friend of mine that he studied world religions. Well read, challenges me all the time with books. And we read books together. I have other friends of mine going, why do you read that stuff? You see, I love that because not only has he systematically studied world religions, he systematically studied the claims of Jesus. And at the end of the day, that's where he stands. And some of you need to get involved in a small group, in a Bible study, in a podcast that is systematically studying the word of God. And through your day-to-day -day actions, begin to build your faith. We teach our kids all the time when you lose something. We just teach them, have you prayed? Have you asked God where your keys are? How many times I've gone through the house raging? You ever been there? Anybody else? Don't look at me all spiritual where I've got to be somewhere and I can't find my keys, Jason, and I'm just, I'm running through the house and it's Danielle's fault and it's, it's the kid's fault and it's the cat's fault. And it probably is because all cats are from hell. But anyway, um, <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's everybody's fault except mine, right? And Danielle will finally just look at me and go, have you prayed and asked God where your keys are? No, I don't want to pray. Now, and how many times we've sat down and, and we've done this. And just pray, God, help us find our keys. And Dad Gum will hear one of the kids, hey, Dad, here's your keys. We're like, he had it the whole time. <laughs> Taste and see, as King David said. See for yourself that the Lord is good. And when you do these things, listen to what happens. I'm telling you, those doubts are not going to go away. But what you're going to begin to do is strengthen your muscles. And here's the last thing. And I'll say this as we close. Find the root of your doubt. Ask for help. Take care of your spiritual health. But you may have never heard this before in church. Hold the tension. Hold the space. Because there's going to be some things. Listen to me. Listen, 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 listen. You are limited people with limited minds. I am a limited man with a limited mind. And there are going to be some things that I am not going to understand about an unlimited God. Did you hear that? There's going to be questions that I'm just going to have to wait until we get there. And maybe when we get there, we're going to be like a little kid in a classroom. And Jesus stands there going, and Jesus goes, you got any questions? And we're going, ooh, 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 ooh. We're going to be excited, Right? And we're going to be asking a question, Jesus, Jesus, I got a question. It's been bugging me. Exactly how does predestination work? And some of you are going, what? Others of you are going, yeah, I want to know that. See, some of you don't have a clue what that is. And you're better for it. <laughs> hey, Jesus, Jesus how, how, does that, how does that whole Trinity thing work? Because I know about the ice and the, and the steam and the water. And I don't really get that because... Could you explain that? Jesus prayed for a puppy. 
And I got a little brother. <laughs> Sometimes it's simple, isn't it? Until then, we can just say, I don't have all the answers to every peripheral thing. But I can still believe and have questions about eschatology. I can still believe and have questions about predestination. That I can still believe in an almighty God and have questions about the Trinity. Because at the end of the day, I am limited and he is unlimited. So that's not irresponsible. That's just being aware of who we are. Being aware of who we are. And remembering that God's not afraid of your questions. In fact, go back to that board. Just maybe, if you're sitting here this morning, and here's what we're about to do. I'm gonna let you look at that for a minute because we're gonna pray. I'm gonna ask the band, y'all come on back up, guys, because we're gonna, we're gonna respond this morning. It's just a simple response. This morning, we're gonna take communion. And for those of you that have a relationship with Jesus, we're gonna invite you to take communion. You don't have to be a member of Summit Heights, but if you have a relationship with Jesus, that you can come and take communion. We have two tables at the front, two at the back to pray together, and then Clay and the team will lead us out in worship. But I, I wanna ask you this question this morning. Maybe you're listening online. Maybe you're listening on television, and, and maybe you're sitting out there going, yeah, but I still, I, yeah, but Edward. Then let me ask you this question, okay? And I'm gonna leave you with this. If that's you, and you're so sure because some of you are so sure, because you've reached the conclusion, you've been there so long now, it's like impeachment, you can't back out, amen? <laughs> I don't even know where to laugh at that, right? <laughs> Just maybe that you're right, and that's you, and you know everything. And you, you don't have anything to lose. We're glad you're here. Keep coming back. Safe place. I see, some of you love the Jesus people, but you doubt Jesus. And that's okay. You're welcome here. Keep coming. You're probably not going to be comfortable long term, but keep coming. Okay? But what if? I'm going to close with this. What if you're wrong? And you've lost everything. And we've gained everything. Those of us who have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ. See, some of you in this room, very honestly, you're not an atheist. Agnostic, maybe. You may be listening and can't wait to see the comments on Facebook of all you atheists that listen. I think it's interesting you're listening. I'm not here to fight with you. I'm just here to ask a question, what if you're wrong? Are you willing to risk that? He loves you. He's not here to slam you. And you're basing your whole life based on a psychology class, a psychology degree. And you've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. And you're missing out on the greatest peace that a man or a woman can ever know. That's why he came in a manger. He loves you. So let's, uh, let's stand together. Can we do that? Thank you for being here. I'm so glad you're here. Don't miss next week. We're going to talk about virginity next week. Some of you uh, have that doubt. There ain't no way a virgin birth, Edward. I'm way smarter than that. I see nurses. I see PAs in the, in the, in the crowd. No. <laughs> Come back. Find out. If you're curious, come back. And so you may have it all figured out, then send this message to somebody that doesn't. Clue them in. Let's take communion. And maybe this morning you might need to spend some time in prayer. We'll have some people up here be willing to pray with you. But let's respond this morning. And think about this. Think about this this week. As my buddy left the other night, that was the last thing I drew for him. And I don't know where he is. But to be so confident he was an atheist, the last thing he said to me was, maybe I'm not. <laughs> maybe I'm not. Listen, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. But at the end of the day, I know what Jesus has done for me and how he's changed me. 
So Lord, I love you. Thank you for today. We ask all this in that beautiful name, Jesus. And everybody said, let's take communion. And there'll be some people here. If you need prayer, you come. But let's respond. Then Clay will lead us out in our last song. Come on. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.